So usually we would do sessions like this as part of the uh, members' uh, annual general meeting, um, really talking about the internal discussions that we've been having at OASPA and sort of how we see the, the past progress and the future uh, kind of ahead of us. We decided to move this into the, the main part of the program this year um, for a few reasons. One, I think there's, it's, it's a point in our development where we'd like to sort of explain what OASPA's agenda looks like and, and what our priorities are to the wider community. And also people just didn't come to the AGMs at least not enough. So this seemed like a good way of, uh, you know, having a session that people would sit, sit through. So um, in looking at, at kind of how to structure this, uh, I decided to start with really looking to the past, um, figuring out what our objectives were, what our priorities were, how we've done on that. And then um, as some context, this over the course of this year, the board has been meeting um, it, for sort of longer strategic sessions than we've done in the past. Uh, and we thought this is a good time to reevaluate how things have gone and if there's any changes we need to be making in the future. So a lot of this is outputs of discussions that we've been having at the, uh, at the board level. So as was mentioned earlier today, uh, organization was first founded back in 2008. There was, I think, 10 organizations that were part of OASPA. Uh, by no means were these all the organizations engaged in any form of open access, but uh, you know I think it was a much smaller uh, group group back then. Uh, at the time, we did have a mission and purpose that we put together, and if you read through it, it's you'll see on the next slide it's uh, quite similar to our current one. But um, it basically said the mission of OASPA is to support and represent the interests of open access journal publishers globally in all scientific, technical, and scholarly disciplines. To accomplish this mission, the association will exchange information, essentially providing a forum for the exchange of information experiences related to OA delivery of scientific content, set standards by promoting a uniform definition of OA publishing, best practices for maintaining and disseminating OA scholarly communications, and ethical standards, advanced models, by supporting the development of business and publishing models that support OA journal publishing, advocate for gold OA, which we kind of defined, um, by promoting gold OA journals and policies that support their viability, educating the research community and the public on the benefits of OA journals and the value publishers bring to the publication process and on various policies that enhance and support the delivery of OA publications, and promote innovation by contributing to the development and dissemination of innovative approaches to scientific communications pertaining to OA and of related activities that leverage the opportunities afforded by OA to scholarly content. So if you looked at our mission yesterday, you would have found more or less the same thing. We had updated a few uh, little bits of wording that were outdated. We got rid of gold OA and talked about open access publishing. Um, Slightly more substantially, we did add books to the scope of the organization. Uh, a few years in, we decided that uh, open access book publishing had uh, needed to be part of the conversation. And we've also updated some of the language to uh, make it a little bit less um, STM focused and, and more inclusive of uh, other disciplines. But largely, over the last 10 years, we've had the same mission and the same objectives and priorities. And um, so, you know, I, I wanted to start by looking at how did we do in, in, in relation to these? So the first, exchanging information. Um, that's what we're here doing. And I think in some ways, that's probably the most visible part of what OASPA has done over these 10 years. Um, we've had successful conferences in Sweden, Czech Republic, Estonia, Hungary, Latvia, Thailand, France, the Netherlands, United States, Portugal, and now Austria. Um, that takes a lot of work. And uh, you know, I think it's uh, been a big part of, of what's kind of help form this community. More recently, we've tried to extend the reach uh, outside of the, the physical conferences that we hold. So we've been having a series of webinars covering a really diverse range of topics. What's interesting about the webinars is that in addition to covering topics that we might not address at the conference, we're also able to reach uh, an audience that is not able to come to, to the physical meetings. Um, this includes some of the scholar publishers, uh, who have an interest in this field, but it's not their full-time job. It includes uh, publishers and others from uh, uh, 
uh, developing countries. It includes um, you know, people just from related communities as well, or people working inside of publishing houses that are not the kind of people that the publishers send to physical meetings. And so you have a broader reach. I know at Hindawi we've had quite a number of people watching these webinars. And we've also, uh, since Layla joined us two years ago, gotten a lot better at having uh, a, an active blog and a more uh, active social media presence. So I think, again, uh, exchanging information is one of the things that we, we've done pretty well, in, in my opinion. Setting standards is another area that's been a, a, sort of a big focus of the organization. Um, probably the, the main way that this comes through is in the membership application process. And we've uh, talked about this uh, at previous conferences. Uh, Claire gave some statistics last year about it. Um, I don't think people necessarily know how much of work goes into that. Um, we get now over 100 applications a year. Uh, re relatively small percentage are accepted, but every one of them takes a fair bit of work to uh, communicate with the applicants, analyze the information they've submitted, look at their websites, really dig into what they've been doing, and it's something that we take very seriously. Um, it's interesting that at the, the early days of OASPA, there was already concerns about what is now termed predatory publishing, but at the time I think was just the sense of open access publishing isn't serious or there isn't the same level of quality control. And we thought it was very important to ensure that this setting of standards is, uh, is a key part of what OASPA does. Now, apart from the upfront application of members, the other thing the membership committee uh, sometimes is tasked with doing is investigating complaints that are brought to our attention. And, um, you know, I wouldn't say this is something that is, is happening um, all the time. It, it's relatively infrequent, but when we do get complaints or concerns brought to our attention about the members, the membership committee does a very in-depth investigation. And these have resulted in members being suspended and in certain cases terminated from, uh, from OASPA's membership. Um, and, you know, I think, again, it's, it's an important part of the process for us to be able to demonstrate that the members of OASPA are clear in explaining what it is that they do, what processes and policies they have in place, and that they really follow those. We don't prescribe particular models of peer review. Um, we're happy for people to innovate and, and have all sorts of models. But what we do require is that they're transparent about that. And so uh, if there's a claim that a particular model of peer review is being followed and it turns out not to be, or there's any other sense of uh, um, misinformation uh, around what a publisher is saying, those are areas where the membership committee has had to get involved. And then we also felt that uh, the standards that we put in place are not things that only need to be applying to our members. Uh, these are really broader uh, issues that other organizations uh, are, are facing as well. And so a few years ago, we worked together with the Committee on Publication Ethics, the Directory of Open Access Journals, and the World Association of Medical Editors to develop the principles of transparency and best practice in scholarly publishing. And um, this is a sort of a set of standards that many people have cited and referred to uh, and are really being used to identify what is good practice when it comes to scholarly publishing. And again, I think we're always trying to walk the fine line of not being prescriptive in, in saying how publishing should be done but still upholding the standards that are important to make sure that we, we maintain the trust of the, the research community. In terms of advancing models, um, there's a few different ways of looking at this. One is to just look at the, the growth of the output of our members and the, the diversity of uh, uh, sort of content that, that's coming. If you look in 2008, I'm not sure how clear some of these numbers are, but the overall output, including all fully OA content, hybrid content, and books, was around 25,000 articles a year. As of 2017, it was just shy of 300,000 articles a year. So there's been more than a tenfold increase over these past 10 years. So not only has our membership grown from the founding 10 organizations to now it's 130 something or so, but we've also had a, you know, a huge increase in the output of, uh, of open access. Interestingly, you know, I think there's been a lot of discussion already and there will continue to be about things like hybrid open access. And it's interesting to see the uh, sort of growing impact in recent years. 
Now, whether you feel this is a good or a bad thing, I think it reflects the diversity of uh, the landscape that no longer is open access confined to fully open access journals, but that's probably about 70,000, well, no, I guess that's a stacked cumulative graph, so that's, I don't know, maybe 50,000 articles of uh, hybrid coming through last year. The, um, the next point in our mission was about advocacy. And uh, there have been a number of issues on which OASPA has issued a public uh, position statement, one of which was related to uh, text and data mining rights um, and the proposed changes to copyright law that would limit text and data mining, as well as uh, uh, OASPA has publicly supported the uh, DORA, the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment. In addition, OASPA representatives have contributed to a number of policy groups, um, including the Open Science Policy Platform and, and a number of others. However, and this is something the board's talked about quite a bit this year, advocacy is one of the key areas where a lot of people, I think, have expected OASPA to do more than what we've done. And in the later bit, I'll, I'll get into the reasons why um, we have been relatively silent in a lot of the contentious debates in relation to open access these days. Educate, so I wanted to include exactly what was in that statement because educate is um, not the clearest statement there, but essentially educating the research community and the public about the benefits of OA journals on the value of publishers bring to the publication process, and on various policies that enhance and support the delivery of OA publications. So really, uh, you can look at this in terms of uh, a broader outreach program, and it's something that we've, again, done in a pretty limited way. Uh, we do have the blog and a social media presence, which does, uh, I think, get some attention in the research community. And we've worked to support other initiatives like Think, Check, Submit that are focused on the research community. But for the most part, our active engagement with the broader research community has been limited. And again, that's something that we'll uh, uh, discuss in a little bit. Promoting innovation, uh, one of the objectives that we'd set. And you know, I think one thing we have done a good job of, uh, both at this conference and in other forums, on the blog and, and through social media, is highlighting the innovation within our membership and really showing the diversity of publication models and, and sort of new ideas that have, uh, that have been emerging. Um, you know, I don't know if the intention ever was that OASPA itself would be innovating within the open access publishing space, but I think uh, really the, the objective here should be for OASPA to show the innovation and really help support what, what uh, our members and others are doing. Um, but this is also something when we looked at the where things stand today in 2018, there's a lot of interesting things happening around open access that involve organizations that are not our members. Um, a lot of the rise of preprints uh, over the past few years uh, has been a place where there's been lots of innovation. We do not have uh, any of the large preprint servers as members of OASPA. I think there's also uh, new publication formats uh, and you know, I think a number of initiatives that aim to really change how scholarship is communicated, not just the business models, but the formats and, and uh, the delivery mechanisms. So that's something that uh, we probably have not been as proactive in ensuring as part of the OASPA community. So that was one of the objectives that when we looked at it, we, we felt instead of relying on the inbound interest that we get, um, and there's a lot of it, you know, the hundreds of applications from potential members every year, we need to carve out some bandwidth to be proactively going out and identifying and engaging with potential members who we think would enrich the community. And to a certain degree, we've been resource constrained, but we've identified this as a, a really key priority because as the landscape shifts, we don't want to find that OASPA has sort of been pushed to the side as other organizations are uh, uh, taking up the issues that are core to, to us as um, members. So kind of looking back at these, I think uh, we've generally done pretty well. Uh, you know, I think if you look at where open access was when we first started the association 10 years ago and where it is today, it's come a long way. And I think OASPA deserves part of the credit for that, certainly not all of it. Um, 
it's also important to recognize the really limited resources that OASP was operated with. So for the first five years, there was no staff. It was entirely uh, the voluntary efforts of, of the board members, essentially, and, and some um, other uh, committed members. And then for a couple of years, we ran with uh, Claire as the uh, sole staff member of OASPA. And then uh, two years ago, we were fortunate to have Layla join the team. But again, in comparison with other organizations of, of, um, in a similar space, we are far, far less resourced. Uh, if you look at an organization like Crossref or STM or Alps or any of these other groups, it is a much smaller amount of uh, time and, and resource that we have. And so we have to be very careful in how we allocate that time because there's just so much more opportunity. And I think everyone within the membership would like to see the organization spending more time on the issues that are important to them. And we have a diverse membership, and so I think we have to make difficult choices sometimes. And realistically, a lot of the resources and time has been spent organizing these conferences. Uh, you know, it's for people that have been involved in conference organizing, it's not an easy thing to do. It takes a lot of time, and doing it every year in a different place, trying to keep the program fresh, making sure that we're not repeating the same things over and over, it's, it's been a real challenge. So, um, you know, I just wanted to add that as uh, some context that uh, even where we stand today with the two full-time staff we have, we still have to be very careful in the, uh, the way that we allocate our attention. But over these last 10 years, one thing that we've realized is that the landscape has changed a lot. Um, the world is not what it was um, back in 2008. First, uh, there's a much greater complexity of business models, I think largely in 2008, when we looked at things, we thought the APC model was going to be the predominant model, and there were other models at the time, and no fee open access journals, and uh, journals that were subsidized by a university or library. But largely for the, uh, certainly for the commercially run journals, and, and probably overall for open access journals, we sort of felt APCs were the way it was going to go. And in the years since then, we've seen a huge uplift of um, you know, hybrid and then offsetting deals and uh, various um, institutionally supported models where there are sort of licensed deals between either um, universities or funders or entire countries and, and publishers. And that's had implications. I think uh, a lot of the expectation was in 2008 was that if we move to an open access model largely driven by APCs, that a lot of the market dynamics that we had felt were problematic in the subscription world would naturally go away. Barriers to entry would be lowered, price-based competition would be increased, and value for money would be uh, something that would operate in a way that didn't exist in the subscription world. As the, these new business models have come into place, I think there are important questions that we now need to look at as to is the objective purely open access and achieving access? Is it also about addressing some of the market dynamics uh, that we had sort of hoped would be addressed with this shift? And sometimes there's going to be um, things that work um, against one of those two objectives. And you know, I think this is where a lot of the concerns about hybrid or about offsetting have come from. Um, Second point was that there's, yeah, I think it's sort of the, a follow-on from that, that there's this tension now between increased open access uptake and achieving these other objectives about cost, competition, and transparency. And if a national level deal is able to increase open access uptake by X number of articles, um, but it has the impact of entrenching well-established high prestige journals, is that something that OASPA should be standing for or against? And it's, it's not an easy uh, question for us to answer. Then another issue that's really evolved a lot over the last 10 years has been all the questions related to peer review and, and quality assessment. And you know, I think there's uh, a lot of conflicting objectives out there. Um, some people feel that ensuring the rigor and quality of, of pre-publication peer review is an important thing, and that needs to be maintained. A lot of other people feel the costs of peer review um, are not justified, and that there is more bias, delays, and inefficiencies than if we just get everything out and then find some other way of uh, assessing it. 
And so as we look to even conduct our membership process, we have to look at um, what does quality standards, you know, how, how do we um, look at these? And I think the stance we've tended to take is any approach is okay with us if you're clear and transparent about that approach. But I do think this is something that uh, you know, we hadn't really thought about at the outset, was what is our, our stance on uh, the value of peer review and sort of quote unquote quality control within the, the, the publishing process. And then you know, the last point is just the growing diversity of content types. Um, research data as well as um, you know, other things, protocols, methods, uh, figures, uh, all of the, these uh, things that are you know, probably not emerging as quickly as some would hope, and I think there is some sense that um, somebody needs to do something about this, either publishers or OASPO or research funders, and um, you know, that's another area that uh, the world's just gotten more complicated since we first started 10 years ago. So when you look at the, the changes in the, in the background and uh, what's happening in the ecosystem, this has posed some real challenges for OASPA. One is that the diversity of organizations within our membership, their priorities, and their beliefs has really uh, grown quite a bit. Um, as we talked about a little bit on the panel, I think at the outset it was very easy to feel we are all part of the same movement, we all have the same vision and the same goals, and as we grow and as the market develops, I think it's clear that we have different priorities and objectives. There's then these highly contentious issues that come up, things like hybrid open access and price caps for APCs and whether or not there's any long-term role for non-open access publishing models. And these are issues that it's difficult for OASPA. Um, who even gets to decide what the official position of OASPA is on this? Is that we take a vote of the members? Is it that we take a vote on the board? Is it that we have some spiritual leader that we look to and they decide what the future is for us? And, um, you know, I think it's, it's been one of the things that has uh, been a challenge for us. And, and why we haven't been as vocal as some people would have expected on uh, some of the really contentious announcements that have come out. Um, a good example is Plan S. We haven't yet gotten a statement out on Plan S. We may or we may not. Um, and I think this is one of the issues that the board has been thinking through is when something like Plan S comes up, a lot of the other associations have a very clear position on it and they're able to speak within a matter of 24 hours. And I think we're quite cautious in saying, how do we decide what the, the stance of the organization is? And is it the job of OASPA to advocate for change that is um, counter to the interests of some of our membership, a large part of our membership? Um, you know, these are things we, we really kind of struggling with still. And again, reiterating the limited resources, that even if we had a clear sense of how we wanted to respond to these things, or that we wanted to engage in certain ways, we just have a limited bandwidth. And so we don't have the, uh, the opportunity to put out position papers in 24 hours. And you know, I think uh, when Planus was announced, sort of an email goes around to the board members trying to figure out who's got the time to look into this and, and really try putting together statements. And can we then, as a voluntary board, work together to get, uh, get something out. So that is still an ongoing limitation that we have. So when you look at the diversity that I've talked about, it's, um, I think sometimes it's easy to see this as a limitation of OASPA. And people say that we're just ineffective as an organization or that we should be able to do more. And um, I tend to disagree. I actually think that the diversity within our membership reflects the diversity within the larger ecosystem. And yeah, it would be a lot easier if there was only 10 members and they had a very clear position and they were advocating for some uh, position with, with a single voice. But we have a lot of that, right? I mean, if you go on any of the listservs, if you go on Twitter, there's lots of those advocates and so it's easy to find. And I think OASP is an interesting microcosm where we get to have these discussions and debates and it doesn't happen overnight and sometimes change is slow. But I do think it's been a real um, achievement that we've been able to keep new entrants, old established publishers, um, advocates 
all sorts of various groups, some of which um, in various contexts are really opposed to one another, to work together and try to find some path forward. And so at times when we do feel like things are challenging, and we should just say, look, this is the stance. You're with us or you're, with, you're not, and you can go quit the organization if you don't support this mission. I think something would be lost there. And yeah, we could say a lot more. We could put out a lot more statements. But I'm not sure that we would help promote progress in any meaningful way. And you know, to be honest, if there were easy solutions to these problems, we would have solved them a long time ago. And often the, the loudest voices that you hear in these arguments make it seem like these are really easy things. Oh, if we just got rid of the impact factor, everything would be fixed. Or if we just flipped all of our journals to open access, everything would be fine. There's enough money in the system, it'll all sort it out. And at a very, very high level, there might be some truth to those statements, but the reality is a lot more complicated. And again, it's not that the reason we haven't progressed faster is not because there are entrenched interests who are actually controlling the system and, and we're beholden to them. It's not because everyone is stupid. It's not because nobody knows about these things. It's because they're really hard challenges. And I think that's something that OASPA needs to keep in mind as it looks towards the next 10 years ahead, is how do we make progress on these really challenging issues and keep moving the ball forward? I don't think this is an excuse to just stand still where we are. But I also don't think that the right approach is to say, let's just take the most extreme position that we can and you're either with us or you're against us. So, if you were to check our mission statement today, after 10 years, it has now been revised, and I'll sort of read through at least the opening bit, which is meaningfully different. Representing a community of scholarly publishers and related organizations, OASPA is committed to developing and disseminating solutions that advance open access, preserve the integrity of scholarship, and promote best practice. OASPA is a trusted convener of open access stakeholders and a venue for productive collaboration. One of the core goals of OASPA is to support the transition to a world in which open access becomes the predominant model of publication for scholarly outputs. Another core, core goal of OASPA is to help ensure a diverse, vibrant, and healthy open access market that supports a wide variety of innovative solutions and business models. We've also slightly revised some of the how statements about how we're going to do this, but uh, I'll leave it to you to read those on your own. This is now up online. But I think within the, the top part, it's important to notice the difference from our original mission statement. In the beginning, the mission was to represent the interests of our members. It didn't really say much more than that. It didn't say towards what end, what is the direction of travel. And I think here we've highlighted a couple of important uh, objectives that we're focused on. One is to supporting this transition to a world in which open access becomes a predominant model of publication for scholarly outputs. And if you notice that doesn't sound as firm as it could be, you're right, that it does not say the only model. And that's something that uh, there has been a lot of discussion over the past six months on the board. And again, I think this is going to be part of this ongoing discussion that we have. Is there any role in our mind for uh, any scholarship to be behind uh, some sort of access control barriers? A lot of people in the organization say no. Some of the people say yes. And I think that's a healthy part of the debate we should have. But I think at least we've made a very clear statement that we don't just view open access as something that is okay or something that can exist over at the edges. We see this, all of us, as the direction that the, the, the world is moving and what we're trying to achieve is a world where that is the prominent model. We also more explicitly call out the need for a diverse marketplace and I think we had previously assumed that that was going to be an inherent part of this transition that as, as we move to open access small and large publishers and uh, old and new entrants would have both better sort of a level playing field to operate within, but there would also be um, price-based competition and competition based on services. And I think the experience over the past 10 years says that's not just gonna happen on its own. We need to identify this as a key objective and have um, initiatives and, and sort of activities focused on achieving that. So in addition to the, the mission that we've got, we've also identified a few priorities for how we want to spend the, the limited time and, and resource that we've got. 
So one is being more active in engaging with funders and policymakers. And a lot of what we've talked about this morning uh, has really gone to show that it's most likely going to be funders and policymakers that drive change in the market. And by having direct communication with these groups, I think we can help, um, well, let me just hop back. One of the th things that we've really felt is uh, the statement that OASPA is a trusted convener of stakeholders and a venue for productive collaboration. So that's something that we really think we can do in the context of working with funders and uh, other policymakers, is bringing together people who are honestly trying to solve problems, whether they be from publishers, from universities, from funding agencies, and actually lay these problems out on the table and try to solve them. And so I think uh, that direct engagement with uh, the funding community is something that we're, we're going to be putting a lot more effort into. Um, to be honest, in the past, it's I think some of the board members within OASPA individually had uh, relationships and conversations with funders, but OASPA as an organization was largely uh, uh, not present at those conversations. And again, part of it was resource, uh, that we were focused on uh, the sort of day-to-day -day operations of the organization. But I think there's also a, a growing recognition of how important that community is. The second point is really looking to where there are practical challenges that we can solve. And you know, a good example is that the offsetting deals that have uh, been taking shape over the last few years have really highlighted the fact that there is no easy system at the moment for universities or funders or countries to directly engage with fully open access journals and have centralized uh, financial support. It's been a little bit easier with offsetting deals because the idea is you know, this university or this uh, country is already spending X amount of money with this publisher, so you come to some negotiated agreement, you add some money on top, or you redefine things, and now you've got open access taken care of through this existing payment channel. But what about for publishers that don't have those, uh, those agreements in place? There isn't some agreement that you can just tack on uh, some extra wording to and make the centralized funding happen. And one of the strange implications of this is that as much as funders and universities have said, oh, we don't like hybrid, hybrid is what they're paying for. They're not paying for fully open access journals. And if you're in the position of having a hybrid journal and people say, well, why don't you flip it to being 100% open access? If you did that, you'd immediately lose the funding stream that you've been getting from paying for those hybrid charges. And apart from that, it is a very limited group of organizations that can engage in those sorts of discussions. I think, uh, you know, the 135 members that OASPA has, which is still only a small fraction of the total uh, open access publishing landscape, they don't get to have conversations with the Dutch government, or the German government, or any of these consortiums. I mean, even someone the size of Hindawi, and we're relatively large as far as uh, uh, pure open access publishers go, we are not big enough to have a seat at those tables. And so I think that's something where there is starting to be an increasing acknowledgement from the funding and uh, university community, as well as from publishers, that this needs a solution, and OASPA is probably in a pretty good place to uh, facilitate this. We don't yet know what the form of that solution is going to be. There have been very preliminary discussions, but it might be a model agreement where Instead of everybody negotiating bilateral agreements with different terms and all of that, there is a standard agreement that everyone puts in place. There may be some sense of central flows of money. Um, I think there are you know, pros and cons to actually having funding flowing through a central organization. And I'll lay it out there now, OASP is not in a position to be that thing that money flows through. We're not well resourced for that. But then I think there's also the flip side of um, the money flows is the reporting that for funders or anyone else to be able to get a, a reasonable sense of how their money is being spent and you know, uh, what the outputs of their university or uh, their grantees are, there needs to be consistent uh, reporting that can either be done in a centralized way or in a standardized uh, distributed way. And again, those are areas where I think OASP is in a great position to bring together the right stakeholders and start having these discussions. Um, again, we don't have any of the solutions quite yet. The third point is an increased focus on outreach and engagement with the research community to encourage even greater adoption of open access publication models, also to dispel some of the concerns or myths that they might have about open access. Um, 
But again, we need to be realistic that there's no way in which Claire and Layla are going to go engage with millions of individual researchers. Um, so we need to find ways that we can do outreach at scale. And I think part of that is engaging more in public forums. Um, you know, I think whether it be the, the trade press, the public media, um, doing interviews with the likes of The Guardian or Times Higher Ed, that might be a venue. Um, also being able to work with other um, voices in the, in, the, in the community to help amplify their message or make sure that they've, uh, they're really understanding issues properly. <laughs> Fortunately, I think in the next couple of years, the, the attention individual researchers are going to have to start paying to open access is increasing. And Plan S is going to make them people that have been ignoring it for a while, they're going to have to start caring. Um, I never know about things like paywall the documentary if anybody outside the open access world is, has any idea about this documentary. It'd be nice if they did. Um, but you know, I think there, are, there is going to be an increased um, opportunity for OASPA to have a voice in this discussion. And that's something we need to put a resource into. And then finally, widening the, uh, the, the membership. Um, and as I said, there's a lot of interesting things happening that we all believe are part of this open access and open science transformation. And we want to make sure they're part of the community. We want to make sure that people don't start feeling like, oh, ASPA, that's just this thing for the traditional publishers, or that's only for journal publishers, or my thing's so innovative that they're just not you know, the people I should be talking to. And so to a certain degree, we're constrained by the fact that we're a membership organization. So we represent members. Our members we define as organizations that publish. We need criteria, you know, for example, to be able to evaluate them. It would be very challenging if we had advocates on Twitter applying for membership, because how would we evaluate them? What sort of criteria would we hold them to? But I do think that we can take a broader uh, definition of what publishing is to include a lot of the initiatives that are coming out in areas like preprints or data publication or micro publications. And that's already starting to happen, but I think it's going to be a renewed focus for us is to actively reach out and engage with these communities and make sure they understand that they really should be part of this group. Oh, that's it. Got through it. So we do have a bit of time. So we can do a few questions. And then uh, when you're all done asking questions, you can go get some oxygen and drink. So let's have quick questions. Thank you. Hi, so thanks very much. I think that was a very interesting presentation, a very open presentation. And I think some of the, um, the tensions that you have outlined, um, that's not only for OASPA, but I see that in other fora as well. You know, do we just want open access? Doesn't matter how much it costs, for instance, or do we have a costing? But I was wondering, how broad do you want to go? I think, I, I think this is quite an interesting narrative that you have presented, but of course, the broader you are, you could also say the less you can do. So my provocative question would be, if Elsevier would apply, uh, saying we are one of the largest open access publishers, would you take them? If they passed the membership review, yes, we would. Um, and, you know, I do think that, again, it's one of the things that makes OASPA different than other groups or initiatives, that uh, we have a relatively broad community of members who have different opinions about important issues, and I think that's a strength. Um, but I think what you got a, a sense of in this conversation is that we need to be clear about what these tensions are. And I think one thing we haven't done as well of in the past is talking about, you know, we would just be silent on issues because we didn't feel we could make a meaningful statement. And maybe what we need to do in the future is talk about why we're being silent about things and talk about the controversy and the diversities of opinions. And maybe rather than an OASPA position statement on Plan S, we should have five OASPA position statements on Plan S and we all talk about the various issues. I don't know. I think there's a, it is nice when you can try to distill something out and say, this is what this group believes. And where possible, we should be doing that. 
We've done it a few times in the past. I think there have been meaningful statements that we've managed to get full support on. The new mission statement is one of them. I think that, that took a lot of work over the last six months to really come up with an idea of what can we say the 130 or so members of OASPA broadly believe is the objective here. But uh, I agree, it, it does mean that uh, we can't take as strong a positions on contentious topics. Okay. Martin Hicks, Barshline Institute. Um, one of the things that uh, we are sort of hoping for with uh, OASPA is that it will be the voice of the, shall we say, the smaller publisher as well. And I think you mentioned that essentially at the end of, the, uh, of your talk. Um, I understand now, having heard you speak, some of the complications and the difficulties of, of getting um, sort of clear statements coming out of such a diverse membership. Um, but I would say that I think, um, as you pointed out, it is necessary, Plan S is an example, to come out with some sort of statement, be vocal about it, even if you haven't got a clear position, there could be different positions, but to simply be the voice of open access publishers in a way which, um, you know, we're, we're a small, well, we're a large group, but most articles, you know, in scientific publishing, 60 plus percent are published by the big five, and they're the ones sitting at the table all the time. Um, and the smaller ones do lose out on certain things. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, you know, one of the, I agree with the desire, and I'm, what I struggle with is how to best achieve that. And, you know, an interesting change that we've had at Hinawi, and I use it as an example because I've seen it close up, is we've started talking, and we didn't used to as an organization. Uh, you know, it's, it's only quite recently that we started having clear position statements on things. And over the past year or two, we've done this, and I think that maybe that's also what's needed, is individual members from within the community um, to express their views. And potentially, OASPA can have a role in highlighting that, facilitating that, driving attention to it. But I do agree that uh, it's a lot easier for large players to have a voice, both because they're large and they have a big reach, and there are organizations that are very closely aligned with, I guess, what people presume their interest to be. I think it's also important to note that within the large organizations, um, there is a huge diversity of opinions. And there's a lot of people in this room that come from those sort of big five large organizations who are fully committed to making open access happen and are doing everything they can. And I think it's wrong to overlook the impact that they have had because you dig into a lot of these numbers and it is because of some of the large publishers embracing open access um, that we've made as much progress as we have. But I do agree that this is something that OASPA needs to find a way to help either amplify the voice of smaller members or provide a forum where they can speak. And some of that's been at this conference, some of it's been at the webinars, but it may be that on policy issues as well, we need to find a way to, to highlight these views. Guess we could do our own scholarly kitchen, right? That works really well. <laughs> Following directly from that question, um, it's, it's quite evident um, that OSPA to date has been largely representative of European, mainly and to some extent um, North American um, open access scholarly publishing interests. Um, talking about your limitations, to what extent are you able to be a little bit more inclusive of the developing world? Um, the interests and differences and um, a additional viewpoints um, of, of and I, I kind of feel um, obligated to ask this question being, being from African Journals Online. Thanks. Yeah, so I would say in my mind the issue is not inclusivity. I think that we've never once been um, intentionally exclusive or even unintentionally exclusive. I think what we could do better at is becoming more proactive in engaging and, and sort of uh, uh, engaging with that community. Um, a lot of it is, is the resource constraint that uh, not on our side, but on, on the side of those publishing organizations. Um, Caroline mentioned it during the panel session earlier that in the early days of OASPA, even the board was set up to be an equal balance between scholar publishers and professional publishing organizations. And at some point a few years in, we had to change the structure of how the board worked because despite all of our best efforts, we could not get 
scholar publishers who are in a position to actively be part of the board. And this is not because there's lots of travel to board meetings or anything. This was basically all telephone calls. But the fact is, even that for people that have other things going on is a big commitment. Our membership process is very open. I think if you look at, uh, you know, for any member of OASPA that's interested in running for the board, um, I believe we have a very fair and inclusive process. But I also recognize that's not sufficient to make sure that you're representing those voices. And so it may be that we need to be more proactive and find ways of engaging with those communities in a way that works for them. And um, I'm certainly open to ideas on that. If you would like to become an ambassador to help us do this, I'd be very happy with that. Thanks. I'm happy to give, become an ambassador um, if the membership fees are waived for us. <laughs> um, on, a, on a completely different point, um, and this um, might be a, a, a drinks question rather than a question for now, but do you guys, um, does your committee have a mechanism for assessing whether the peer reviews as stated by the applicant members um, is implemented? So there are ad hoc things we can do and sometimes have done. It's obviously very difficult to know what is happening behind the scenes of peer review, but my understanding is the membership committee at times has contacted editors, academic editors from a journal, and asked them uh, what their experience has been. And in the case of um, complaints that have been brought to us, um, we have dug into things, and we have worked with our members and while trying to preserve the confidentiality of the peer review process, um, evaluated where things seem to have gone wrong and looked into those. So I think there have been at least a few cases where we asked for um, some evidence of the peer review process that led to uh, either, you know, extreme cases of retraction or publication of um, just obviously fraudulent material. Um, but it's not something that, you know, on a wholesale basis we can monitor for the 135 members what goes on behind closed doors of peer review. So um, I thought that was a great presentation, actually. Um, so one of the so I wonder if while you were kind of preparing for that, whether you were thinking about um, how we will know if we're making a difference, because I think you know that's that's one of the things that's most motivating of all. You know, because you're right, we are resource constrained and stuff like that. But as a as a as a group, I should I should say I'm on the board as well. Um, so as a group, we will be more motivated if we can kind of get a sense that we're actually making a difference. And so have you thought about, you know, we have the graph which shows the, the, uh, the, the increase in the amount of CC BY content, which is great. Um, obviously, that's not just down to us, as you say. But are there other things, you know, given the expanded scope that we're talking about, that we can say, you know, this, this is how we could judge ourselves? Yes and no. I think there are areas where we can if we do some of the things back on this slide, you know, if we can help find a solution to the, the centralized payment for uh, fully open access journals, that's something we could point to as, as a real success. With some of the public engagement, we may be able to point to specific areas where we've had an impact, but largely no. And I think uh, that's one of the things I've struggled with a lot as well, looking at, uh, you know, internally within our own team and as well as at OASPA, how can you tell if what you're doing is making a difference? And it's great to be able to measure things, but if you take it to too far of an extreme, you end up back in the impact factor world, right? Like if you can't measure it, then it doesn't really matter. And so I think to a certain degree, we have to rely on our own assessment of whether we're focusing our time in the right ways. But I do hope that by setting priorities, and one thing I've been speaking with uh, Claire a fair bit about, is having more concrete objectives for the year ahead. I think we've often been just playing catch up because there's been so much inbound membership applications and conference work and all of this, but setting clear objectives that a year from now we will have wanted to achieve X, Y, and Z, and that's something that we, we can hopefully be able to measure. Given the lack of resource and your focus on these specific priorities, have you identified things that you're going to stop doing? So, uh, one thing that we have changed, it's not that we've stopped doing, but one thing we realized we were spending a lot of time evaluating membership applications, and the vast majority of them were from um, sort of single journals. And so we've uh, made a change to the membership application policies that uh, if you're a scholar published solo open access journal, first you need to be in the DOAJ, and then we'll evaluate your application. 
and that should be limiting the amount of uh, evaluation we do because the fact is even if it's a relatively small proportion of the landscape, evaluating individual uh, applications from really not credible or not serious organizations took up a lot of time. So I think that that's one shift. Um, and again, I think getting better at uh, just having two people instead of one person does make a difference. The conference is a little bit more routine and we're able to manage that a bit better. But you're right that uh, it's, it's still a very tight uh, group and I think the best we can hope for is to be able to tackle one or two substantive projects each year on top of the normal day-to-day -day business of running the organization. Unless you'd all want your dues to go up and I'm, hopefully that's good the case. Tomorrow you can come and uh, show your support for that in the AGM and then we'll have all sorts of resource to, uh, to devote. Just a, a comment or maybe a comment and a question mixed together the, of your new objectives, the top one and the bottom one. So you have a bottom objective of, of broadening the diversity of voices and members um, in the OASPA community, which I think is really important and it's, it, it, speaking as somebody who runs a membership organization, it's impossible to do that if you don't do it very deliberately, right? Seeking out and being able to say, this is what you get back for being part of this community. I'm curious how to reconcile it with point one, which is talking more or more actively engaging with funders and um, policymakers. If you're not an advocacy organization, what are you talking to policymakers and funders about, and how can a new member who's maybe an academy based, you know, smaller publisher understand? What, what's being discussed and how their, you know, sort of voice in your organization is being, their opinion is being represented to those, those funders. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it does. I think, in my mind, the most useful thing we can talk about when we are engaging with policymakers and funders is, first of all, the complex issues that require nuance. I think the things that where we can just come out with a very clear statement, we kind of don't need to talk directly to the funders about because they'll have seen our position on it. It's in understanding the nuance of why there are certain things where there are just complex answers. I think as well some of these topics like um, figuring out uh, practical solutions to funding flows and reporting and all of that, those are areas where by engaging with funders we can make a, a meaningful difference in how things are implemented because there's a huge difference between the proclamations that might come out at some point and the actual systems that end up getting implemented to put these things into practice. And if OASPA can have a role in making sure that in this point between declaration and implementation, things are done in a way that's actually going to achieve progress, that's a huge step forward. Um, and again, I, I think in my view there are other organizations, if, if the idea is to be a loud, clear voice on one side of the debate, I think there's other organizations that are better suited to that than what OASPA is at least today. 